The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning and welcome to this webinar focusing on the Health Status Monitor project, shortly HS Monitor, where we're looking for ICT-enabled monitoring to improve health status and optimize hypertension care. My name is Trahil Birov and today I'll be moderating this event. Uh, we have 73 attendees and counting and we've had over 100 registrations, so we're quite happy that you're interested in learning more about the project, about the funding opportunity and potentially helping out address a challenge related to hypertension management. The, this is a series of what we call open market consultation events. There are several others. So um, this webinar will of course be recorded and you'll be uh, able to get go back to it and to the questions and answers that uh, we'll go through. But um, feel free also to have a look at the other events that we have scheduled uh, on the website of HS Monitor, hsmonitor-pcp.eu. So the objectives of today's webinar are to introduce you to the project overall and the planned procurement and its scope. Uh, HS Monitor is a pre-commercial procurement project, so called PCP. So we want to explain to you a bit what PCP entails, how it works and details on the participation process because a call for tenders is expected later in the year. Uh, an important aspect of these open market consultation events that is that we consult with what we call potential suppliers. So there are two main roles here, procurers and suppliers, potential interested suppliers are yourselves. And we want to inform you about the opportunity, we want to consult with you on the scope of the procurement uh, and uh, the feasibility of what we plan for the time period of the project. And another function of the open market consultation is to facilitate the establishment of partnerships because for these kinds of projects where we have, in this case, procurers from several different countries, this procurement scope is quite big. So you might be in need of joining um, consortia, forming partnerships, and this is part of the project. Uh, we're trying to facilitate that through the open market consultation questionnaires. We'll be talking about this in a second. And you see here the presenters we have. We have a special guest, our project officer, Orestes Kaliancidis and Ozan Bechan and Miriam Martin. So I would just ask you from left to right if you can present yourselves to the audience. Orestes. Hello, good morning. Uh, this is Orestes Kaliancidis. I'm project officer for HS Monitor and working for the eHealth uh, Wellbeing and Aging Unit of the European Commission. This is in DG Connect. Uh, thank you very much for, for inviting me in, in, in this presentation. Thank you. Hi, good morning. This is Ozan from Ministry of Health of Turkey. I'm working for General Directorate of Health Information Systems, which is the countrywide collector and processor of health information, and also the lead procurer of innovative ICT-enabled health, healthcare systems like electronic health records, decision support systems, chronic disease management programs, etc. Um, our innovation procurement budget for uh, 2020 is 120 million euros and we are hoping to receive good results from HS Monitor so that we can procure it at a large scale after the project trials finish. Thank you. Hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Miriam Martin. I work for TIC Biomed. It's a cluster organization based in Spain. And uh, the aim of TIC Biomed has always been to uh, bridge the gap in between the health organizations and the companies so we are really involved uh, into uh, really bridge this 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 gap and uh, communicate uh, and facilitate the communication between the companies and the healthcare organizations. And I come from uh, Empirica, which is a research consultancy in Germany, and we are supporting the procurers. We're supporting the overall PCP process in the project. 
Um, just a few housekeeping rules. We will next present a series of small presentations focusing on different aspects of the procurement and the project overall. And then we will give enough time for questions by the audience at the end of this series of presentations. And there are two ways to provide your questions uh, when that time comes, questions and feedback. One option is to use the functionality of GoToWebinar. There's an option called raise a hand where you can raise a hand and then we'll go through and uh, you can talk and pose your question. And the other way is to use the chat box, the questions box uh, to provide a question and then we'll be looking also at these. Uh, but again, I suggest that you wait a bit with your questions because some of the answers might come up during the presentations. We will have enough time for all of your questions and if we do for some reason uh, get tight on the time, uh, we'll collect the questions nevertheless and provide a frequently asked questions uh, section on our website. I hope that you can hear well and the audio is working. I don't see any complaints in the chat so we'll proceed with um, the overview of the topics we want to cover today. So we'll go through a brief uh, introduction into our project. We will then uh, move on to a bit more details about the expected scope of the procurement and the aim of the procurement. We will look at the policy side, policy and implementation of innovation procurement, followed by a deep dive into the details about the phases and participation in the HS monitor tendering process. We will then conclude with some next steps and uh, how we can stay in touch. And then as we mentioned, we'll have a dedicated questions and answers section. Starting with uh, the session about the overall project, this will be presented by Ozan. Ozan, please go ahead. Yes, thank you, Strahil. Um, although you have already done that, I would like to once again welcome all the participants to our webinar. Thank you very much um, to all of you for your attendance. It really means a lot to us to see your presence here today during these difficult times. My humble but sincere hope for all of us is to overcome the challenges of the outbreak and see healthier and brighter days ahead. Um, HS Monitor is about hypertension. It's a hypertension project. We are looking for ICT-enabled uh, monitoring to improve health status and optimize hypertension care. Therefore, the problem we are aiming to address is hypertension, monitoring of it, and self-management of it. Why hypertension? Because it's a disease that the procurers of the buyers group of the project are suffering from. Hypertension is a silent killer. It can present no or few symptoms and contribute to low awareness among the affected population. It becomes even a more uh, life-threatening risk factor for people with comorbidities like those with coronary artery disease, stroke, heart failure, chronic kidney disease, etc. Essential hypertension is the form of high blood pressure without a known cause, and it's linked to a range of lifestyle and also genetic factors, for example, lack of physical activity and unbalanced diet, smoking, salt intake, maybe alcohol consumption, factors like that. Next slide, please. Um, speaking of some statistics here, every fifth person in the world is suffering from hypertension. One in five adults worldwide have high blood pressure, and high blood pressure is directly related with half of all deaths from stroke and heart diseases in the world today. Hypertension is the most prevalent cardiovascular disorder, which affects 20% to 50% of the adult population in developed countries. And literature from epidemiological data has shown that control of hypertension is currently achieved in only a small percentage of 
total uh, hypertensive patients. Yes, therefore, in a nutshell, the goal of the project, the main aim of um, HS Monitor PCP project is to procure uh, research, research and development services in the form of a solution that will provide innovative ICT-enabled monitoring to improve health status and optimize hypertension care. Mm, I would like to give you some facts regarding the project consortium about the composition of HS Monitor partners. We are 10 partners from across Europe. We have five procurers in the project consortium, which also constitute the buyers group. And we also have five other partners who act as supporting organizations to the execution of the project. We started HS Monitor last year in October, and the project is planned to finish in early 2023 after running its 42 month calendar. We have a budget over six and a half million euros, uh, over 4.6 million of which is going to be used for procuring the sought for solution. We are five procurers pro from uh, four countries. We have Minister of Health of Turkey, the lead procurer of the project, who acts on behalf of the other procurers and launches the call for tender. We have Zagreb Health Center from Croatia. We have two procurer partners from Italy. One is Lombardy region and the other one is Federico Secondo University Hospital, and we have region Jamland from Sweden. The procurers group combined have a population over 96 million, and almost a third of this population is afflicted with hypertension disease. The other five partners we have in the project are not procurers, but they're important players in terms of supporting actions and research and development. Two of them are Emprica from Germany and TIC from Spain. They are both represented in today's webinar. I would like to thank them also for their presence. Um, two supporting partners are also from Italy, besides our two Italian procurer partners. And we have one more clinical partner from Croatia. The project is also supported and given consultancy by a qualified advisory board, which consists of legal, ethical, medical, and technical experts. Um, I myself am very proud of this consortium. We have a very good distribution of roles to quite experienced partners. The procurers are among the biggest buyers of innovation in Europe. We are supported by a valuable expert board, and many of us have worked with each other before. It gives us synergy and aspiration for, for this project too. Well, HS Monitor is an EU project. It's, uh, it's a European Union project, which is funded by the European Commission under the Aid Framework Program, which is Horizon 2020. So the project and the solutions we are seeking should link to key EU policy priorities, some of which are projects on the screen. We are addressing a key policy priority of the European Commission's communication on enabling the digital tra transformation of health and care in the digital single market, which is digital tools for citizen empowerment and for person-centered care. We therefore should empower the patients and healthcare professionals. We should take the patient's preferences and choices into account, not only in the application phase, but also in the designing phase. And we really should allow to agree on goals and approaches, making the patient an equal partner in their own care process.
HS Monitor is a PCP project. It's a pre-commercial procurement project. What this tool is that um, pre-commercial procurement PCP, it challenges industry from the demand side to develop innovative solutions for public sector needs. And it provides a first customer reference that enables suppliers to create competitive advantage on the market. PCP, um, PCP enables public procurers to compare alternative potential solution approaches and filter out the best possible solutions that the market can deliver to address the public need. And this competitive process is executed in phases. This is the timeline chart of HS Monitor. It is actually the timeline chart of any PCP project as, as there are no dates here. Everything starts with curiosity driven research, which is followed by open market consultations, similar to what we are doing at the moment. After that, we call for tenders. We launch the procurement and request for bids uh, for the procurement of the applied R&D services. The main three phases of a PCP project, which are executed on contractual basis are phase one, two, and three, which respectively are solution design, prototype development, and development of test products and services in limited volumes. Um, from face to face, there's always a filter of selection about which we will give details later on, later on the presentation. Um, there is, or there may be another phase after the PCP ends, which is called PPI, Public Procurement of Innovation, which deploys commercial volumes of end products. And this is currently out of the scope of HS Monitor as, as it would be out of the scope of any PCP project. Now, I would like to give the floor to my colleague Strahil from Emprica for the next section, which is aim and scope. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ozan. Just to compliment that it is a, a competitive tendering process, so you have plenty of opportunities to present your solution. And if you're selected and go through the phases at the end of phase uh, in phase three, we're looking for at least uh, two solutions. So um, the chances of, of you being able to develop your solution are uh, quite quite good. Okay, we want to. Um, talk a bit about the scope of the plant procurement and um, obviously the main unmet need that we're looking uh, that pr the procurers are looking to have addressed through this process is uh, related to hypertension care and we'll see how we've uh, approached this and what we're looking for is integrated solutions as there we know during the proposal of our projects, we've looked at uh, different uh, elements that we're looking for, and we know that there are some elements out there, but they're fragmented. So we're looking for integrated solutions that cover a wide area of um, what we call building blocks, and um, the solutions work interoperable. They are interoperable with the existing systems and work seamlessly at the procurer's um, premises. So where we started is we identified what we call hypertension management building blocks and you see them here, nine of them, grouped into three groups, those related more to delivery of services, those related to devices, systems integration, and the third group is around organization of the healthcare. And uh, if we go through them quickly, we have early detection and prevention, which is quite important for identifying early on those with high blood pressure so that they can be uh, treated. Healthier lifestyle, nutrition and supplementation, a very important aspect of uh, hypertensive patients, ensuring a, a good healthy lifestyle will help manage the disease because it is a chronic disease. As of yet, there's no known cure, so it needs to be continuously uh, managed and healthier lifestyle is a key aspect of that. The third block is about the fact that through ICT-enabled monitoring, 
we hope that we'll be able to much faster optimize the drug therapy. We know that uh, because of our healthcare systems, because of the numbers of visits we have, it, may it might take uh, months and even years before the, optimize, uh, the, the optimum treatment is found with the several different uh, uh, pills that you have to take. So we do hope that with ICT-enabled monitoring, we'll be able to more quickly enable our healthcare professionals to optimize the treatment and, and find the best combination of, of pills and approach that is most suitable to the patient's needs. Another aspect of this building block is obviously treatment adherence. Uh, we know that hypertension, because it is the silent killer, because people don't really um, um, have physical pain in most cases, they don't take it as seriously as other diseases like diabetes, where you see directly uh, changes and problems. So uh, treatment adherence is a challenge and we want solutions to address this aspect as well. Um, devices and remote monitoring, obviously devices have a place here. We have, it is a research and development project, so we do expect that some degree of, of uh, use of devices uh, in an innovative way or in a new way, a more optimized way, will be part of the solutions to enable monitoring and ultimately to get the data necessary to make the, the, the uh, management and the care more personalized and to support both uh, patients with decisions and healthcare professionals, so the block called personalized decision support. A very important aspect is interoperability and integration because we want those solutions to not be working isolated. That's why we have the different phases and in phases two and three uh, suppliers uh, will be working directly with the procurers, with uh, representatives of their users. Uh, they will have to integrate into the existing systems of the procurers to ensure that um, the solution is being used um, op optimally and uh, this is also an incentive for the procurers to, pr to buy the solution beyond the project if it is well working with the existing systems. Um, uh, we've noticed uh, from past PCPs that it is very important really to early on identify the necessary prerequisites for, for integration. So in the call for tender, we'll provide as much as possible information about the existing systems of our procurers, about any standards they uh, have to follow, uh, about any APIs that are available. So this will be part of the call for tender documents. Quality and outcome reporting is obviously another building block that needs to be addressed in the solutions as well as patient professional collaboration and coordination. Here we're looking for solutions that really uh, enable better communication. We're, we'll see uh, in the draft use cases that we're talking about shared care planning, where we try to personalize a care plan for a specific patient, taking their goals, taking their um, objective and, and, and uh, situation into account to enable to uh, agree on more personalized treatment and, and uh, approach. Training and education is important again because hypertension is not really identified by citizens and patients as something uh, too dramatic. There's no, um, uh, yeah, training and education is also part of this aspect. So these are our nine building blocks that we've identified and then since then we've been working on them, uh, working on elaborating under each block what kind of uh, of um, progress we expect that uh, will be addressed through the supplier solutions. This is kind of a summary on the main aspects of uh, the, the expected future solutions. They need to empower citizens, patients, and healthcare professionals to benefit from better hypertension management. And this should be based on individualized needs and goals uh, we want to, for, to address also um, early identification uh, of citizens who are at risk or those who have already have hypertension. And of course, uh, with our ICT-enabled solutions, we don't want to um, uh, reject or uh, change the role of the, of the GP or whoever is, is making the diagnosis. So um, the solutions aim to provide uh, not a diagnosis, but to just early identify patients who are at risk and this needs to be followed up by the respective healthcare professional. Integration, as we mentioned, is an important aspect. 
we're looking at the patient or the citizen's journey going through the health continuum. We have a slide on that in a second, but we're looking at use cases and functionalities that relate to prevention, uh, to, to treatment and to home care mainly. Uh, on technical and organizational levels, we want to enable to, the transition from someone who is a citizen uh, being identified, diagnosed with hypertension and moving uh, uh, and becoming a patient. So uh, in terms of data flow and data generation, we need to take this into account, the patient journey. Um, obviously, the solutions need to be able to process various sources of data, uh, the existing systems of the suppliers, of the procurers, pardon, uh, maybe patient health data and other data uh, to provide this personalized aspect of the solutions. Um, another aspect that we mentioned was the optimal drug therapy and um, seeing the patients as equal partners in the process, so enabling a shared care planning um, into the solutions. So based on these building blocks, we've been working over the last months with the procurers to define what we call specifications, the thing you see in the middle. And this is comprised of different requirements that we've identified, different use cases where we try to describe expected functionality and results, and complementing the use cases are process models, which are just a bit more visually oriented and uh, focused on how the use case goes through the, the processes, what kind of database it needs, etc. And uh, as I said, this is this has been going on uh, within the consortium. Uh, each procurer has a team of experts uh, complementing the different uh, areas that we need, clinical areas, technical expertise, some legal expertise related to the data collection and, and data processing. And um, we currently have over 150 requirements and nine use cases in draft mode. We're still working on them because we're also looking at the market. We're doing some uh, update of the research uh, that we did in the proposal. Of course, the idea in PCPs is that um, there's no current solution on the market. So we're making this market check yet again. Uh, we're also supported by the advisory board uh, members who are also giving us uh, good tips. But then another very important aspect where we want to involve you is uh, this part to the in the bottom, through the open market consultation events, we want to present to you the current state and we want your feedback and opinion about the scope, whether we're missing something important, whether you see something that in five years time should be definitely a part of uh, ICT enabled hypertension management that we have missed, whether you see that uh, it is realistic within the time frame of our uh, procurement project that uh, the, these kinds of solutions are can be available, whether we are too ambitious or not too ambitious, any kind of feedback is useful for us. And you can do this uh, through different ways. One of the ways is through the questions and through the feedback we receive during these open market consultation events. We also have a dedicated questionnaire that uh, Miriam will talk about later on. And then of course, you can always provide an email where you uh, give us uh, your feedback on a specific use case or on a specific aspect of the procurement. So um, if we look again at the health continuum from prevention through diagnosis, treatment and home care, we so far, again, so far, these are draft uh, use cases and, and requirements. We're looking at services that address both citizens, so citizen facing services related to uh, promotion, awareness, basic training, uh, early detection and, and basic support for healthier lifestyle. And then if these citizens do become patients at some point, they will receive the, the core of, of HS Monitor services, which is the patient healthcare professional related services, which are about individualized training, personalized coaching for healthy lifestyle, shared care planning, drug therapy optimization. And then we've tried to put here a few databases so that you get a, a, a feeling about um, where we see uh, data coming from. Um, the challenge of PCPs, because they are research and development projects, is to find the right balance of how much we uh, restrict 
our requirements and use cases. So we're trying to find this balance, we're trying to keep things open while at the same time um, expressing what are at least minimum requirements. So for example, certain standards need to uh, be set to be able to integrate to systems. We're looking at the standards of the EHR systems. Um, so yeah, um, finding the balance is difficult. In the use cases, we're focusing on not so much restricting the exact way a use case should run, but we focus on what the end result should be, leaving you with enough uh, area of, um, with enough space to decide how exactly you approach the implementation of a certain use case, what technology you're using. Maybe you're using uh, an avatar or, or different innovative ways of uh, delivering the core of the use case. So all these, uh, this current draft information is available as part of the open market consultation questionnaire that Miriam will be talking about. So we do encourage you towards the end is the section about this questionnaire to fill it in after the webinar and through the questionnaire you'll see the link to the current draft use cases and the requirements where you can also provide feedback on that one. Okay, so um, this was the second part. The third uh, session is about the innovation procurement itself, policy and implementation, or as it is. Uh, thank you, Sahil. Uh, in, in my turn, I would like to thank everybody who joined today uh, in this webinar of HS Monitor on behalf of the European Commission for your presence here during this difficult time. Uh, what uh, I would like to, to do from our side is to uh, discuss uh, a bit what uh, pre-commercial procurement means in the framework of uh, HS Monitor, uh, what's in it for the procurers and uh, potentially for you, uh, what, what can you get from this uh, process and what challenges lie ahead uh, as this uh, procedure will unfold in the next few months and the next couple of years. Uh, I think we can start with the first slide. Yes, thank you. So, uh, pre-commercial procurement, uh, uh, we are speaking of pre-commercial procurement here on, on a rather strict framework of uh, compared to what innovation procurement and, and, and PCP is in general. There are several ways of doing it. Here we are speaking of a commission instrument, uh, actually a, a grant. Uh, which is aimed uh, to generate uh, growth, uh, mostly in, in the EU and the participating uh, countries to Horizon 2020. And we are speaking of a demand side instrument, meaning that it is the, the procurers, mostly the, uh, the public sector and, and uh, adjoined uh, private uh, companies who are actually shaping uh, the, uh, the process and its outcome. This, this grant the Commission is financing is uh, supporting uh, a procurement process which is what uh, the buyers group the procurers are organizing now so what are we aiming with that and what are the main characteristic uh, characteristics the procurers are buying research and development we are speaking about the ultimate goal of developing a solution here but the process is what was described before by ozan the three phases uh, where you design a solution, you, you uh, develop a prototype and you test it in order to get there. Uh, it is the, the public sector, the procurers steer the development of this solution according to their needs. This identification of needs is happening now as we speak uh, through this open market consultation. Uh, it will continue and, and be shaped well with the tender documents and, and the launch of the tender. And uh, there will still be uh, tweaking and shaping uh, in the three phases of the procurement. And we are speaking here of a, of a challenge which needs some sort of radical innovation. So we are not speaking of a solution which is in the market now or, or, or really close to the market, but the solution which really needs to be developed. Uh, the, the benefits are that uh, uh, the risks and the rewards from this process are shared between the procurers and the suppliers. Uh, and uh, that the tender specifications are uh, developed uh, through consultation with, with you as the community, that supplier lock into one solution, for example, is avoided, and that as we go, 
the different technological alter alternatives from the various suppliers are compared uh, and uh, in order for the best solutions, uh, a minimum of, of two, we would say, hopefully more, uh, would be selected by the consortium. Uh, next slide, please. So what, what are the benefits for, uh, for the procurers and the EU public sector? Well, uh, notably, it's uh, modernizing the public uh, services. So uh, usually this uh, has to do with quality, uh, for example, in offering healthcare and efficiency of how we offer them. It is cost. And obviously, these benefits translate uh, normally to citizens. Uh, uh, a smart use of the procurement budget, which aims at, like I said before, avoiding uh, a locking with one supplier, but also uh, developing a solution in a cost effective manner, getting value for money. Then uh, there are benefits to uh, local economies, the economies where uh, the procurers operate and the economies uh, where the suppliers operate. And obviously for us, uh, it's of uh, ultimate importance uh, having growth and uh, jobs in Europe, as there is also uh, a requirement that most of the research is done in the EU. Next slide, please. Now, what's the, uh, the benefit for suppliers? Well, uh, let's say in uh, more, more theoretical terms that uh, this PCP process can, can open new markets, uh, can, can lead to sales of, of the solutions developed, and also can, let's say, create an innovative edge to the companies that participate in the process. Either an SME or, or, or a bigger company, we've, we've seen it in several PCPs, bigger companies find it uh, very interesting uh, that they participate in, uh, in, in a process in direct contact with the procurers. Uh, SMEs are exposed in ways of working with the procurers, but also in competing with larger companies, which make them more competitive. Then uh, it is the obvious uh, advantage of testing uh, the solutions in a real environment. It is, the, uh, it is retaining the ownership of the IPR, which is an additional uh, incentive for uh, uh, commercializing a solution afterwards. And it is a shortening of time to market as soon as this process is over. Now, in more practical terms, we have uh, noticed that uh, the majority of, of contracts in, uh, in PCP's project we have run and we are running are uh, won by SMEs and European SMEs notably. Uh, we have an important participation of uh, larger players as well, up to 20% uh, in, uh, in winning contracts. Uh, we have university startups participating, and we have a third, at least, of our contracts won by companies in another member state than that of the procurers. Uh, therefore, we also, uh, let's say, stimulate cross-border growth. Uh, compared to only uh, up to 2% in normal procurements, uh, procurements uh, across Europe. We would also say that uh, for uh, PCPs that have already taken place, or the ones that are ongoing, we have a very high percentage of uh, suppliers who, are actually, who have actually commercialized their solution or are planning to commercialize more than 80 to 90% of that. Uh, some even have uh, been uh, merged with larger entities or uh, going through an IPO. Uh, next slide, please. So having very briefly gone through the benefits for both, uh, there are uh, maybe in this, uh, in, in this time, there are uh, also several additional opportunities and, and, and risks uh, everybody involved in this process is going to, uh, to face. Uh, and uh, speaking of this uh, time, I'm, I, I mean the, the, the spread of uh, the COVID-19 disease and uh, the aftermath of it. Uh, one thing we, we notice more and more, and I think you are able to notice as well, uh, is that procurement has become very important in this time. And while now everybody is, is focusing and competing in the procurement of uh, critical medical equipment or, or masks, um, uh, which is rather obvious, as, as soon as this first phase is over, uh, we think that innovation procurement will be particularly relevant. And, and why is that, especially in the area of health and care? 
and, and this is because we see new needs as, as, as emerging. For example, and, and I think this is very relevant to HS Monitor, uh, the monitoring of patients is particularly important. Uh, patients with hypertension, uh, we, we know for a fact now that uh, they are not safer than anybody else uh, if, uh, if, they, if they catch this particular disease. So patient monitoring is a horizontal need now. Uh, it is uh, a, a need in order to have, let's say, healthier patients at home. It's a need in care facilities. You see what's happening in, uh, in, in EU countries in, in these particular environments. And it's also very important in, in, in hospitals. Uh, in order to have, let's say, a, a quicker assessment of the health of the patient, but also less exposure of the health personnel into, into, into viruses uh, like this one. Uh, there are other needs which are emerging. For example, uh, innovation will be needed when it comes to uh, assessing the bed availability uh, in hospitals or new models like dynamic uh, needs prediction or improvements in the logistics of hospitals and healthcare providers. And, and, and all these will also necessitate improvement in skills, both of healthcare personnel and of patients. So th there, there will be loads of opportunities. Uh, there are also uh, new risks particular to this instrument. Uh, we see that procurement is becoming a much more urgent business. Uh, the, the sometimes uh, healthcare providers need to procure within a couple of days. And, and this is uh, something that needs to be balanced against the legal complexity of, of a process like uh, procurement and the time constraints, and also how to hold uh, processes like this one, like an open market consultation in uh, times of urgency. Those who are better prepared in the public and the private sector will be the winners in this case. And, and, and also, uh, we all need to find ways of uh, being more flexible in, in tender and contract management. Uh, what we do from a commission's point of view, uh, some things you might have seen in, uh, in the news maybe, uh, for shorter measures like repurposing cohesion funds to address the epidemic, uh, going to joint procurement of key, of key equipment for the EU and member states, so creating stockpiles or uh, easing the conformity assessment of, uh, of medical technology. Um, as, as DG Connect uh, and as the Commission, we are also uh, um, have open uh, funding opportunities uh, our, our unit has uh, at the moment a pre-commercial procurement call which is open and has been postponed for June in order to attract uh, possibly uh, more procurers interested in a similar process and have more projects like HS Monitor uh, procure innovation for health and care. And at the moment we are also uh, having the, the discussion for the long-term measures. In, in our case, uh, they are more uh, specific to uh, how the new instruments, Horizon Europe and the Digital Europe program, uh, will support innovation procurement among others. Um, this is, uh, in, in, in a few words, let's say, uh, the, the point of view of the Commission in this process. I advise you to uh, follow closely uh, what Strachil and Ozan said before me and, and what will follow because it's more relevant to, to you and, and more specific to the process that will follow. But I think it's also good that you have the, uh, the bigger picture of why innovation procurement is, is prominent now as a commission policy and how it can, uh, it can help and it can be supported in the future. Thank you very much, Orestes. Okay. Then we'll move on to a bit more details about the tendering process delivered by Ozan. Yes, thank you. This is Ozan once again. I think I'm taking over at the exact same slide where I left. Only this time we have the indicated budgets for each base and a clearer timeline for the project. After launching the tender, in the summer and evaluating the offers in the fall, we are planning to start phase one in December and finish phase three in early um, 2023. For detailed information about each phase, can we move forward to the next slide, please? 
Um, phase one is the concept, conceptual design, solution architecture, and technical specifications of your offered solution. It's the shortest of all phases. The majority of it takes place on paper. Therefore, it has the least budget and most competitors in the game. We expect to fund five solutions in this phase, and we expect the suppliers to develop a detailed specification of their proposed solution, which should address technical, economical, and organizational requirements. The expected output in this phase, um, actually at the end of the phase, uh, is a detailed report describing the solution and a detailed plan for uh, prototyping and testing activities for the following phases. Uh, please remember these will also be your binding offer for the next phase. The indicative budget for this three-month phase is close to uh, 700,000 euros and not only in this phase but also in the following two phases the offers are ranked according to quality price ratio and contracts are awarded until the remaining budget for that phase is insufficient to fund the next best tender. In phase two, we expect to fund four suppliers, and in return, we expect them to turn their promising ideas into well-defined prototypes, which at the end of the phase should be demonstrated uh, by the following prototype specification, prototype demonstration, plan for development of a limited volume of solutions for field testing, and um, updated cost-benefit forecast, including a preliminary business plan. Um, the budget for this eight-month phase is just under 1.4 million euros, and once again, the offers are ranked according to quality price ratio and contracts are awarded until the remaining budget for that phase is insufficient to fund the next best tender. Phase two is more active and interactive than phase one. This is when site visits start to take place and a more dynamic co-creation of solutions begins to take place. So I expect a lot of communications, uh, expect a lot of communication with the buyers group in this phase. Phase three, uh, the piloting phase, the big phase, where much of the research is taking place. We aim to realize implementation of pilot solutions in the testing sites of all five procurers. We expect to do this with two different solutions. The indicative budget of this phase is roughly 2.5 million euros. And the end of the phase, and um, at the end of the project eventually, an overall assessment and success verification, as well as an updated cost benefits forecast, uh, including a preliminary business plan should be provided by the suppliers. Uh, one last but not least thing I can say about phase three pilots is that we are aiming to execute the pilot with 50 patients and around 10 healthcare prof professionals in each of the pilot sites per solution. So it means 250 patients and around 50 uh, healthcare professionals uh, in total per solution. Phase four, commercialization is out of the scope of HS Monitor, like it will be out of the scope of any pre-commercial uh, procurement project. After the project ends, it's up to uh, not only each of the procurers uh, of HS Monitor, but also the other public bodies uh, from Europe or across the world to decide whether to do a commercial procurement. This decision, this decision cannot be made before the project outcomes are assessed. And since the suppliers retain the intellectual property rights, you are free to commercialize your solutions to other potential customers in your countries, in Europe, or in anywhere else in the world, actually. 
I think now we have a yes, separate section regarding tendering process, which I hope will provide you with sufficient and clear, clear information about how to give offers. We will be receiving the offers electronically by email. We may also require paper submission, traditional submission with regular post, postal mail. Uh, you will be notified in due time. But what we know for now, for sure, uh, is that the submissions will be done uh, electronically. The email address will be shared with you in the tender documents. And we'll, we will make sure to send you a confirmation of receipt once, once we receive your email so that you will not have to worry if your email made it or it failed. The offer consists of three sections, namely administrative, technical, and financial sections. Although we aim to allow five months for the preparation and submission of offers, this has to be decided by the project consortium, as well as the fact that it should be approved by the European Commission. The official working language of the process of all tendering process is English and English only, no offer in any other language may not, e may not even be considered um, a valid offer. Mm, the call for tenders is open to any type of operators, meaning that all companies or other type of legal entities regardless of their size or governance structure are entitled to submit an offer. You can place a bid by a single entity or you can build up a consortium of, suppl of suppliers with other suppliers and submit a joint tender. In either case, your proposal must be able to cover the whole continuous hypertension management solution. This is what matters at the end of the day, whether you are able to cover uh, a whole continuous uh, hypertension management solution. Uh, not, if you are a, uh, not if you're a single entity or you're placing a joint offer. Um, participation in the open market consultations like this one is not a precondition for submitting an offer. The project consortium is currently developing exclusion, selection, compliance, and award criteria. The quality price ratio will put a focus on quality by 70%, which also remains to be decided on. Okay, this is a sample quality price ratio formula, a formula that may be used in the evaluation of offers in the upcoming months. In this formula, a weight of 70% is given to quality and a weight of 30% is given to price. Um, PCPs are not traditional procurement tools. We don't select the technically best offer without paying attention to its price, only because it's technically the best one. And we don't select the cheapest offer without paying attention to the technical aspects only because it's the cheapest one. This is what we do instead. We set quality as our first priority, which leaves the price as the second priority. Once again, this ratio is only indicative. Please, please stay tuned and check the call for tender documents once they are published for the exact formula that's going to be used in the evaluation of the offers. We sign a framework agreement and also uh, specific phase contracts in each phase with the awarded suppliers. During each phase, contract implementation is monitored periodically and reviewed against the expected outcomes, which are milestones, deliverables, outputs, and results for each phase. Satisfactory completion of milestones and deliverables is a requirement for the settlement of payments and successful completion of a phase is a precondition for passing to a next phase. The 
IPR, intellectual property rights. In the past, we received some questions about this. Who owns the IPR? It is the suppliers who keep ownership of the IPRs um, attached to the results generated during the PCP implementation. You keep the IPR of your solutions and you are free to sell your solution uh, freely in the world market. And one last slide about VAT issue in the project. The whole uh, procurement budget of HS Monitor project is planned to be centralized at Ministry of Health of Turkey. Uh, Ministry of Health of Turkey is exempt from VAT uh, in international projects. When we do have a centralized budget, the procurement budget of the project will be exempt from value added tax as well. So we are looking at a VAT free procurement process. And for next steps, I'm leaving the floor to Miriam, I guess. Yes, uh, Osan, thank you very much. So uh, we are going to focus now on which are the next steps or what is the plan schedule. As you can imagine, uh, with the COVID uh, outbreak, uh, everything is tentative. We really try to keep the calendar as we planned. But uh, I mean, some unexpected uh, situations may arise and some modifications um, could be in place. Uh, anyhow, uh, if you follow our account in, on Twitter or our newsletter, you will be fully updated on any change that uh, may happen. So uh, we are actually on the first uh, phase or the first step. This is the open market consultation. As uh, was previously explained, we are now trying to gather as much feedback as possible, as much insight as possible from the industry on our um, idea uh, on, on what we want to procure. So we would really appreciate any, any information that you may send us uh, through the questionnaire that we'll see later on. And uh, we really want to uh, consider your, your points of view on, on our proposal that will run uh, until uh, July this year, 2020. Then uh, the call for tenders will be launched uh, in August 2020 and will be open until November 2020. Uh, then we will have an evaluation and the companies will be selected. The number of, the number of companies um, is the ones that uh, Osan has explained before uh, for the phase one that will start in December 2020 until February 2021. Then uh, another evaluation will take place. Some companies will move into the phase two that will run from March 2021 to October 2021. Uh, another evaluation will take place and then the two selected uh, companies uh, will implement the phase three that will run from November 2021 to February 2023. As you can see, the phase three is the longest one as requires uh, really like an uh, implementation. Next slide, Strahil. Yeah, so uh, we really encourage you to uh, go through the questionnaire and we encourage you to build a strong consortia. We are aware that uh, the solution that we are asking you to develop uh, is uh, quite global and uh, requires different capacities. So it is important to, to find like the right partners just to build the right consortium uh, to prepare the, the bid. So, uh, it's, I mean, uh, we really think that it's important for you to find the right organizations that complement your, your, your solutions. So what we have prepared is the open market consultation questionnaire. You have the link uh, on, the, on the presentation, but it is also on the website. It is really easy to, to, to access. So uh, we will be pleased to receive your feedback, but not only that, but, uh, but at the end of the questionnaire, you can provide your information or your, your data and just uh, propose that you are looking for uh, some partners on concrete issues. Uh, the next 
slide. So uh, we have prepared this uh, matchmaking uh, platform or what matchmaking section on the website with the results uh, or with the with the companies that uh, are looking for for a partner, and the um, the website looks like a did. Uh, look like this. Uh, you will have the name of the companies, but you will also uh, say which uh, type of partnership you are looking for, uh, which is the country that you are looking or you are looking for relevant expertise on that country, but also uh, as we are, are always uh, talking about building blocks, it's like which are the building blocks that you are lacking or that you are looking for. So this is the way that the matchmaking platform it is going to um, looks like. So it will be really easy just to find uh, like the right partners or at least the, the right profiles for you to complete your consortium. Next, yeah. So if you have any questions, uh, you could address all them to this uh, uh, email address, suppliers at monitor minus pcp dot eu. Uh, also, there is one uh, section on the on the website where you can find this uh, mail address. So you can either access us through the, through the presentation or the website uh, and also all questions as it has been explained before uh, there is a, an FAQ uh, section on the website and we will gather all the questions that you will make to us and all the answers that we are given uh, in order to keep the process really transparent so uh, access to the to the website any any time that you are looking for any information And I guess now we can move into the question section uh, and uh, all participants will uh, answer any question that you may have. Thank you, Miriam, and thank you to all the presenters so far. Indeed, as uh, Miriam mentioned, we'll try to answer some questions, but uh, informally for now, please do wait for the official FAQ document because this will be put together based on the input also from all the procurers as, as a whole from the buyers group. So we're giving indicative answers right now, but we are. this is being recorded, the questions are being recorded. We'll put them in the FAQ document, discuss internally first and provide you with the answers officially through the website. So yes, please do use the function raise a hand if you prefer or the chat box, the question box, we have already some questions, so I'll ask our panelists to have a look at the questions. In the meantime, if someone wants to pose a direct question, please raise your hand. Okay, I see the first question from Monica Rufino. Please introduce yourself and your organization and pose your question. Well, good morning, um, everybody. Thank you for the invitation for this webinar. It was a very, a very important presentation um, and very well organized. Congratulations. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm a board advisor uh, of Opcare. Opcare is a Portuguese company, a technology company uh, that uh, has created a monitoring platform uh, for uh, some kind of uh, disease and some kind of health uh, indicators. So um, hypertension is one of our scope. Uh, and uh, we are very interested in this uh, gender and in this uh, market consultation. But uh, we are a company that are not, uh, have not all the block solutions that you refer. So my, my main question is, uh, we should uh, present our uh, offer uh, in a global solution or we can just present a solution for one part of the block. Okay, thank you very much for your question. 
Um, well, I can I can start and then Ozan, if you'd like to continue, but we are looking for a complete uh, solution covering all aspects of the requirements and use cases. So the full specifications that you'll find, the final version of them will be in the call for tenders documents. Uh, we're looking at bids and tenders addressing the full scope of our um, vision. And if yeah. you uh, are addressing just a few of those, I would really recommend that you fill in the online questionnaire, the, the open market consultation questionnaire, and state what you're looking for and try to join other, uh, try to establish partnerships and uh, submit a joint bid. Because you, of course, you physically, theoretically, you can submit an offer focusing on specific things, but it will not be evaluated uh, favorably because we are looking at uh, the full scope. So one of the award criteria currently being drafted is um, relating to the full extent of the vision of HS Monitor as described in the call for tender documents. Okay. Uh, thank you, I understand uh, and I, I think that we will look uh, for the market and to have a, a consortium just to because we know some companies but in this case, it's clear for me that we must uh, answer uh, the total solution uh, for every block that we have present. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the next one I had in my list was Sergei Golovanov. Please go ahead. Hello, hi. <clears throat> Can you hear me well? Yes. Okay, so my name is Sergei Golovanov. I'm general manager of the company Golem Integrated Microelectronic Solutions in Vienna, Austria. And we have uh, the platform which we developed actually not for health, but for other things like making models of complex cyber biophysical systems. It's a pretty new approach, very new ICT. We developed it and it's available. And we found that our partner effectively applied our platform to active aging uh, project. And we see very interesting perspective to comply with this PCP call, addressing fully the scope of the vision which you just presented. So thank you. It was a very comprehensive presentation by all of you. My question is very simple at this stage. Is this, uh, because we actually take part in some calls, so-called open calls in different uh, projects, like let's say uh, new generation internet and so on, some others, ICT. Uh, is, will there be any kind of interference between, let's say, participation and uh, funding and budgeting for the phase one or two with other? participation which had been taking place already. Okay, thank you. That's a hard question for me. As far as I know, <clears throat> there are certain rules to PCPs and we have to look into more detail. For example, state aid is not allowed and I, know, I don't think you can combine uh, funding opportunities, but uh, maybe if, if Orestes has any insights, otherwise we'll have to just uh, discuss internally first and get back to you on that. Well, it's relatively uh, difficult to answer to this question in a very concrete way, the, the way it's phrased. Obviously, it is it probably is a bit more complex uh, than that. Uh, what I have to, what I think would be useful here is to make the distinction between the procurement process itself and uh, uh, participation in EU grants. Uh, let's let's say as a basic rule that what we are discussing today is a, a framework tender that the procurers would run themselves in order for the development of the solution. So the potential suppliers, the tenderers, be it one entity or a group of tenderers, will reply to this tender. They are not beneficiaries to an EU grant. Uh, the beneficiaries are the procurers, so you don't have to deal with us. Uh, you are participating in a tender. Uh, um, and uh, if uh, you or your partners are direct beneficiaries to an EU project funding a particular activity or solution, 
then uh, the question uh, might uh, touch upon what we call double funding. So uh, funding uh, the same thing twice through an EU grant, through two EU grants, for example. But this is a question that needs to be asked in more specific terms than that. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure if I have uh, answered uh, the question here. Yeah, I understand the complexity of the question, but uh, the PCP will start uh, at the end of the year, and we already submitted some proposals, let's say, for Tetramax or some others. And if it will be successful, then we will see a very strange situation when we have already success in one uh, proposal, and then we supply another, and we have success in another, and we are in a very complicated situation. That's the question. My uh, my advice in this case is uh, sometimes it is good to uh, to assess uh, really whether uh, two proposals are the same and if they are indeed the same, then uh, see if you have the success and then be transparent about it. But after you have this sort of multiple successes and before you engage into any commitments, that that, okay, that is you. more or less the window. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I would say, uh, don't uh, over-engineer it uh, before you have the success because it is not evident or obvious that you will be successful in this in this tender. Uh, do uh, see whether uh, your um, your tenders or proposals, whatever it is in each case, are really identical, the same. There is no no difference or, or scope for that. And if you are successful in more than one case then be transparent about it and you might have to do a hard choice there but you might not it depends on the case okay thank you and in any case wishing you success with your bids yes certainly. thank you very much the next one we have is uh, Ir irfan khalid uh irfan khalid that's my name and uh, i I'm head of innovation at a company called Cybercom, uh, which is based in Sweden, Finland, Denmark, Holland, and we have some other partners. We are an IT solutions development and consultancy company. And we actually uh, believe in uh, looking into specific needs and coming up with solutions that are unique and uh, really try to uh, address the problem uh, so we usually try to have a customized approach on these sort of situations and this uh, need uh, that you have presented sounds a bit unique as well so at, at this uh, so first of all thank you for a nice uh, presentation and a, a question or more of a suggestion is have you considered having a group of uh, test users or uh, who uh, could be good to speak to uh, as as the as as the end users of such service even at the phase one so the the so so the people who are participating companies have the possibility to get their input directly into their solution development from the beginning or is that something that you expect uh the the partners or the the participants to do uh only by their own thank you very much um i'll start here because uh thank you that's a, a good suggestion and we're actually following this suggestion we do want to involve user groups mainly patients and healthcare professional representatives as much as possible throughout the project and this means also collaborating with you because suppliers will do part of the project in parallel um, what we've done is during this first phase right now where we're discussing internally as i mentioned we have teams of technical uh, um, clinical and uh, legal related expertise uh, in each procurer we also have asked uh, representatives of their patients and healthcare professionals through interviews and uh, through a, an online survey about what they expect from that kind of solution. So this for sure we factored in already in our draft use cases uh, and uh, I expect that it makes a lot of sense for example that suppliers when they apply either when they apply 
or later once they are granted and go through the phases they use their own uh, sources their own um, pool of uh, potential users that inform the process from the procurer side we do have involvement during this phase to inform our requirements and then we'll have uh, involvement during phase two where you're looking at developing prototypes and they will be tested with a representative uh, sample of, of users from the procurers uh, and we do have the, the final phase where as, as Ozan mentioned the patients that will be testing the solution 50 per solution from the five piloting sites 250 they will be recruited and, and uh, uh, involved through the procurers of course with the help of the suppliers so hopefully throughout the process we have the involvement in the decision in the technical specifications in the testing prototype testing and, and testing of the final solution I think that is great and I think it's almost necessary to have the user and user uh, involvement from the start of course that is what we do when we are doing our innovation uh, processes and workshops to involve them from the beginning so we come up with with the best solution that solved the issue so I think it, it is great that you have already considered that from the start so of course we, we can definitely in that case support uh, if you take part in this yeah it's a, a great collaboration between the procurers and suppliers especially in phases two and three because the procurers have provide access to certain things like the patients the existing systems and then it's a matter of, of pilot visits and uh, a number of meetings where you can use for example our access to the users maybe to uh, get the questionnaire to get some feedback during the prototype testing so it's really a very close collaboration and uh, of course suppliers are also free to get their own user um, feedback if they have access to, to users thank you very much for the question next i had uh, lucia lucia comnes yes hello this is lucia comnes from data wizard we are uh, in an SME, uh, digital health SME based in Italy, and uh, we develop um, ICT solutions for, um, for health with a focus on patient empowerment and medicine, um, so therapy adherence and, um, and patient empowerment around medicine needs. We also have a number of other services that include um, home health monitoring devices and, and um, user interfaces that are oriented towards patients being able to understand um, what they're what they're monitoring from home and also be able to better communicate with with clinicians and medical professionals um, my question is regarding um, <clears throat> the the requirements for the consortium so are we uh, and I'm, I'm sorry if this was already addressed I just I'm not sure I understood correctly are we meant to organize uh, with other partners to create a consortium before we prepare um, to, and apply for the tender? And if so, um, how many partners are recommended or in terms of minimum and maximum? And how many countries should be present in the consortium? Um, I wasn't quite sure if that's something we do or if it's something that the procurers do in terms of the matchmaking. OK, thank you very much. Um, oh, I can start again, but then I'll need some help from from Miriam. As far as I yeah. know, there's no um, no restriction about or no even recommendations. I wouldn't uh, venture to give recommendations on the number of of uh, of people that you want in your consortium. It can be a joint tender, it can be a single tender, depending on your expertise. Basically, if you Thing that you can cover all the building blocks on your own and you can cover also during the if you go through the process to the phase two and three and you actually have to travel to these countries and ensure that the solution is available for example in all these languages and you can uh, substantiate that uh, through your organization then it's fine to apply as a single tender it really depends on what you're missing how good you think you can cover the full scope that's why we're trying to give at least a, a a, ra a rather good idea right now at the latest in the call for tender about all the requirements so you'll see that some of the draft requirements are about servers being physically 
and the location of the procurer's premises, some are about language, and all these needs to be need to be met. Um, the matchmaking we're doing is simil, uh, simply supporting, facilitating uh, those partners who are not that well connected and who would like to just post somewhere in an online forum, which is our website, that they're looking for partners. Of course, in parallel, you can do that on your own. I can assume that there are many organizations that can put up a consortium without our help. It's just an added, hopefully added benefit that we're doing through the project posting about uh, anyone interested in or searching for consortia. And so the idea of the open market consultation, as we said, is early on to inform about the plan and for you to start planning your uh, bids. And this includes consortium building. So you can do this starting now or Hopefully someone has already started doing it and this can be done also during the call for tender process up to the point where the submission deadline will be for now expected in, I believe, in November. So you can already start working on that. Yes, Rahil, this is Miriam. Uh, if I may add, it's like a procurers are not going to uh, intervene at all in the uh, consortia building. Like uh, as Strahil said, there are two points that you have to pay attention to when preparing your proposal. On the one hand is to cover all the building blocks because our idea is to, I mean, to, to involve consortia that are able to, you know, uh, develop or to offer solutions covering all the building blocks. So building blocks is one point. The other point is that you have to test the solution if you go through the three phases in all the different countries and you have to consider that uh, the countries that are involved it is uh, uh, Turkey, Italy, Sweden and Croatia. So I mean those are two important points when building your consortia but when submitting the proposal you need to submit uh, and you need to describe which is the consortia and how you are going to develop a solution covering all the building blocks. So that's why we, we offer this uh, yeah, opportunity to 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 uh, through the uh, matchmaking platform to look for some suppliers that uh, might be lacking some building block or or the other. Thank you very much. That's very helpful. I understand better now. Okay, we have three more raised hands, and then we'll move also to the questions from the question section. Can we hear from another Lucia, Lucia Panese? Yes, hello, good morning, and thank you for this great opportunity. My name is Lucia Pannesi. I'm the CEO of a small company based in Milano. We're specialized in uh, games for health and games for training, and we already work also on therapy adherence and uh, patient empowerment. Um, you've been discussing before with, I think, the Swedish colleague about uh, patient involvement in the process, which to me is extremely important. Um, I heard about things like questionnaires and then piloting through testing of prototypes and uh, and then the final solution. But um, I, I would like to understand if you think it's possible also to do something which is the traditional participatory design phase, which in our case is quite fundamental, which is more than just questionnaires and it comes before the prototype testing. It means like really having some design phases together with samples of patients normally not only in one country. So uh, do you think this is possible and have you thought of that? And just if you can give a couple of information here. Okay, thank you. My personal opinion is I'm just thinking about the timeline and process. So if you do submit a call for tender with your plans, mm -hmm. I, I assume that it will be based on your experience, expertise, maybe during the, that time you would have been able to also consult with uh, some potential users. But I don't think that we from the project side can offer that during this phase. And once the call for tenders are evaluated and you actually, if, you, if you're lucky and you can start to work, as Ozan mentioned, the first phase is a, just a three month phase. So theoretically here you can um, involve users, but I'm not sure to which extent those users can be facilitated, the access to these users can be facilitated by the procurers. It's more realistic that you have your own access to a pool of users that you can uh, 
um, yeah, talk to in in this case. Okay, and in case in phase two, which is a bit longer. Phase two is where we, uh, as the procurers, will provide access to patients. I have to check the numbers. I believe something like up to ten patients will be involved in the prototype testing. Oh, testing. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay, next we have Elvira Perez. Can you hear us, Elvira? Uh, sorry, I think it's not Elvira. In Hello? Let's go ahead. Hello. Uh, well, actually, I'm logged in with another user. It's Bernadette Gravenbauer from Eureka Technology Center in Catalonia. I have a very practical question concerning the questionnaire itself. Uh, we saw that it's very well structured and very, it's very closed format. Uh, could you please indicate the limitation of fields of text? Because we discovered that sometimes it's possible to copy text and sometimes there are restrictions on the ex uh, extension of the text field. Uh, on the one hand side, just for practical reasons, because you narrowed out very much the options to answer. And sometimes it it says something like uh, describe briefly, and sometimes it says please describe, but it doesn't say what do you mean by briefly, and what's the what's the extension of the text we can copy into. And I wanted to ask for the opportunity to attach some file because, in particular, with uh, pre-existing partial solutions, for example. Sometimes it would be very helpful for you just to add you a file or a web a link to a website or something like that. You have a glimpse on it and it's perfectly understandable instead of providing uh, such structured answers, which are rather statistical input than comprehensive input with content. Okay, I'll answer that regarding the questionnaire. When we mean uh, explain briefly, is uh, like go straight to the point. It's like uh, just provide the valuable information. Uh, we haven't got any limitation on the on the I mean on the text that you can include, but it's just uh, like provide the, the the valuable information that could us uh, could help us to improve uh, the way we, we are going to launch the, the, the call or the way we are, we understand the, the building blocks. Uh, regarding the attachment, we could try to think uh, how to modify the questionnaire because as I agree with you, so far there is no uh, option. The other option that you may have is if you send the, uh, the, the, the attached uh, information to the uh, email address that I have mentioned in my presentation. Okay, thank you. Okay. And the last raised hand was from, I hope it's correct, Julia Altariba. Altariba. Hello. Hey, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I'm Julia and I'm I'm the project manager from an SME digital health company based in Barcelona. Um, we have already worked with remote monitoring of several chronic diseases. And my question was that previously, previously, if I have understood well, you, you have said that the solution has to be developed from the scratch but we have already some building blo blocks that we have already developed in our company. So can we still apply from the tender? Uh, yeah, so we are aware that there are some companies in, and uh, stakeholders there that have some of the building blocks and that, that's perfectly fine. The, the challenge will be then to integrate and to complete the whole, the whole scope that we've envisioned. So, um, it's fine that you already have some things that you can use, that you can adapt to the specific needs of HS Monitor. That's a good starting point for you. Okay, perfect, thank you. Colleagues, can we have a look at the questions posed via the chat? Have you identified some that are rather easy to answer already? I'll also have a look now.
Haydi siz Ozan. Let's go ahead. Yeah, there are three questions here asked by Alexander Berler, who has left actually, but I will try to answer them anyway. First question is, will we have to provide medical devices? If yes, can we use devices from Korea, Israel, China, or other manufacturers outside Europe? The first part, will we have to provide medical devices? Um, I think it depends on, it depends on your proposed solution. I don't believe we will require the suppliers to, to provide medical devices, but you are more than welcome to propose your solution with medical devices or without medical devices. Um, concerning where the medical devices come from, Korea, Israel, China, or other manufacturers outside Europe, well, one thing I know for sure is that the devices should be CE certified. We cannot accept devices, medical devices, which do not have CE certification, because that's something completely else. If we want to test a completely a brand new device which doesn't have uh, a C, uh, CE certification, that's completely another story, some other project. So the devices, uh, whatever devices you're offering should have CE certification. Another question is directly related to Turkey, actually. Will you take precautions concerning import-export rules since Turkey is outside the EU market? Um, well, to be honest with you, it's not our obligation to take such precautions. It should be well-defined in your project proposal in your uh, offer, what precautions you are planning to take in order to um, overcome obstacles, if there are any, regarding the Turkey's position being outside the EU market. Another question is, are any needs to certify the solution under the medical devices regulation? And I think this has to be checked with each of the procurers because each of the procurers may have different rules to follow, different laws they are obligated to follow. In Turkey, I can answer on behalf of Turkey, the solution itself doesn't have to be registered at the FDA of Turkey because it is a, it's a pilot trial uh, solution only. But um, let us take notes so that we can share this question with the rest of the procurers who will answer on behalf of their own regulations. Yes, yeah, just to add that, I, I need to read a bit more about, the, there are some PCP related requirements, very specific requirements related to, for example, personnel coming from outside of Europe, I think, without being too specific, I, we have to check, of course, and confirm, but it, there was some rule about uh, no more than 20% of uh, researchers coming outside of Europe or something like that. Maybe Orestes knows more, but we'll also have a check about whether there are any requirements, similar requirements on hardware. Uh, well, Sahil, without being 100% uh, sure about my, my, uh, my answer being complete, uh, the, the requirement is that the location of the R&D activities is a minimum of a 50 percent uh, in, uh, uh, in the EU member states or the associated countries. By associated countries, we, we, I mean uh, associated to the Horizon 2020 uh, program. There is, uh, there is a list of those. So, for example, Turkey is one of those. Uh, regarding personnel, I, I might have to uh, to dig a, dip to, uh, a bit to see if this is uh, really the case. But uh, the, the golden rule is uh, at least 50% of R&D happens in EU member states and participating uh, countries. Yeah, so in the application templates we'll have, we'll have, as Ozan mentioned, administrative, technical, financial, will reflect on these requirements, so in your financial section of the application you will be asked for specific things or to confirm that uh, at least 50% comes from is located 
etc cetera, etc cetera. so there will be these kinds of um, reflections in the templates themselves There's a very simple question. In which countries will the pilot be expected to be run? In four procurer countries, which are Turkey, Sweden, Croatia, and Italy. And in Italy, we have two procurer regions, which are uh, Lombardy and Campania. We actually have some of them on the line, so maybe a, a very brief introduction, and if they have any reflections so far, would be also useful. If you can just raise your hand, because you will appear in the top of my list and I'll be able to unmute you, Marcello and uh, whoever else, else wants to. Okay, Marcello, go ahead. Hello, good morning. Uh, Marcello Megara, Regione Lombardia. Uh, I'm representing here uh, the participants from Italy, from Lombardy. And uh, just to mention that uh, the, the pilot will be centered on Auxological Hospital, the hypertension department that now has been converted, unfortunately, in COVID department because of the, the situation. So our piloting will be centered on Auxological Hospital in Milano and with the support of Regione Lombardia and Aria. Thank you, Marcello. I, I think there was also a question about pilots. So we have procuring regions. Obviously, Turkey, Ministry of Health Turkey is procuring on behalf of the country, but it might make sense to also mention where, at least for now, we plan the physical pilots to be, if that's available. Uh, I know that Marcello just mentioned the, the Lombardy pilot. Then we have the uh, Federico Secondo pilot, which will be in Naples, Federico Secondo Hospital itself. We have, um, I hope I'm not mistaken, but no, actually Marie has raised the hand, so she will be able to save me. I'm not sure, is it Östersund? Marie, hello. Hello, it's uh, Jöran Larsson, uh, head of the R&D at uh, Region Jampen here in Dalen. So, um, the Östersund Hospital and the primary care will be the pilot site in, in Sweden. Uh, it's it's a we cover a huge area, so we need distance independent uh, methods to cover all the pieces, basically. Uh, the the uh, pilot testing will be led by the R&D department at Östersund Hospital. Okay, thank you. Ozan, do you already have ideas which uh, where in Turkey you will be piloting? I think it I think it will be a big hospital, a tertiary tertiary level of care hospital in Istanbul or Ankara. Okay. And uh, in Zagreb it will be the the hospital in the city. I forget its name, but it's the partner that you see uh, on the website. It's the Clinic of uh, Mercy. I believe it's the name. They will be hosting the pilot site. Okay, let's have a look at other questions. There's a question about the language of the systems. How many languages, countries should the prototypes be able to address? A uh, minimum of the procurer regions plus English. So it means Turkish, Swedish, Croatian, Italian. I don't know if there are any differences between Lombardy, Italy, Italian, or um, and Campania, Italian. Um, if there are any differences between dialects, I think we should also pay attention to that. And also English. Yes, one interesting question is, for example, if uh, a supplier notices, let's say in, in phase one, in phase two, sorry, that re they realize that another partner is necessary for the smooth operation, let's say they need some kind of local support, can they add this other partner to the consortium or do, we, do they have to finish with the same composition of the consortium that they started with? 
As far as I remember, because we experienced we experienced this before, they cannot um, add another partner when they are entering a new phase, but they can add a subcontractor, which also has some kind of limitations, I guess, which will be published in the call for tender documents. But I may be wrong, and Orestes can correct me if I'm wrong, but, but for some reason, I remember that in the past, in another innovation procurement project, we experienced this, and the corresponding partner wanted to include another partner when they, are, when they were entering phase two from phase one or phase three from phase two, and they were unable to, because of, you know, because of the rules of the PCP game, they were unable to include a new partner as a partner, so they ended up adding this new organization as a subcontractor only. Uh, Ozan, I think, although your question is clear, I think uh, this is important to raise uh, at, at the stage when the, the, the tender documents are, uh, are finalized. Um, I have, uh, let's say, my, my sense here is that uh, this raises two questions. One has to do with the equal treatment of, of the different participants. So if you, uh, if you add partners, what's, what's the reason for this and how does this affect this process? Because it's a competitive process. Uh, then um, the second one is uh, every supplier at each phase uh, has been selected first time uh, uh, because their tender has been considered uh, sufficient, let's say, and, and, and complete. Uh, for for the development of the solution in three phases and then each subsequent phase uh, because they have succeeded in that and they can proceed to the next one. So the question is uh, as well what, what the need is for, for an additional partner in such a consortium. Uh, I think this is this is also a matter of how the, the tender is, uh, is framed but to, to me it raises questions about uh, well what if uh, all other suppliers say well we would like to add things there uh, partners capacities to, to to tweak the rules a bit uh, i think this uh, this is a question worth having a discussion sorry Mm -hmm. I, th I think we've had cases where, for example, in your planning right now, if you submit a call, then you plan for some kind of local pilot support. We've had this in, the, in a previous PCP. Uh, and you plan for this as a subcontracting. Uh, maybe the partner is not, uh, the subcontractor is not yet known, but you know that uh, at some point we're talking about ICT enabled systems that are quite new. So you will need to think about training, education, change management and uh, we've had a PCP where uh, the suppliers actually hired a special role for this, a nurse uh, that supports the users, the 50 uh, test users in the first few weeks of the process of phase three. So it might make sense to think about cooperating with uh, local uh, uh, organizations to cover needs such as language and training, um, things like that. Uh, my uh, my advice, let's say, to suppliers is whatever you can foresee about to foresee that from the beginning, uh, and uh, then uh, depending on the question, because the needs of the procurers might uh, might require something or might be good to add something for 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 the procurers, it is also if. Uh, if you have, uh, uh, let's say, a new requirement or there could be an improvement, give the same opportunity to all your contractors at the same time. Uh, you, you are quite experienced and, 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 and you know the rules about that. Uh, otherwise, the only thing I can say, it's a, it's a case by case and uh, we'll have to see when, when you get to that. Okay, I don't see any new questions in the meantime and no raised hands, but we'll wait a few more minutes.
Again, you can submit your question outside of this webinar via email. So um, in Italy, just it, uh, okay. Um, so please do feel free to submit further questions throughout the, the, this open market consultation process. We do have more events coming up. We have scheduled events um, in Jemtland and uh, in, in Zagreb. So there will be also obviously webinars that you can participate and ask more questions and get to know a bit better the situation of the specific procurer. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll have also an Italian event planned a bit later due to the current circumstances, hopefully in May, but this is yet to be uh, confirmed. So do visit the website. There you'll get information on upcoming events, the opportunity to fill in the open market consultation questionnaire, the opportunity to look at through the questionnaire to look at the current draft use cases and uh, pros, uh, use cases and requirements and provide your feedback either through email or through the questionnaire itself. And um, yeah, uh, hopefully you can start, if you want to apply, you can start planning consortium building and um, we'll support you as best as we can. Uh, we'll try to react as quickly as possible as a consortium and as a buyer's group. It might take some time for us to finalize the, the answers to some questions to have a complete transparency and confirmation from all the procurers, but um, they will also be available on the website as soon as possible. I would like to thank our presenters and everyone who attended. We did have, we did reach uh, something like 86 or seven participants at the same time. So we're quite happy that uh, there's a lot of interest in, in the project and in the upcoming procurement and we'd like to keep in touch. Uh, thank you very much for attending. The recording will be available shortly on the website as well. Thank you, wishing you a nice day. Thank bye you. Bye.